The fastest racing cars in the world slip from the garages at Indianapolis. Drivers and mechanics must find a way to guide these missiles at 170 miles an hour and beyond. before the 500-mile race, the search for speed, endurance, and control goes on. This is the great adventure. Designing, building, driving a machine good enough to race the fastest 500 miles in the world. It weighs only 1,600 pounds, stands barely 22 inches high at the hood. Its 400 horsepower engine is placed on its side to lower the center of gravity. This is the most radical of all the new cars which will be tested in competition for the first time. Its driver, Sam Hanks, is one of the best test pilots at Indianapolis. Hanks has raced in the last 12 500s, more than 4,000 miles at high speed. George Sally, designer, builder, and mechanic of this new car, spent five years planning. When it was ready, Sally hired the best driver he knew. Hanks is a fierce competitor, yet has an engineer's precision behind the wheel. Save nothing of yourself, but be as easy as you can on the equipment. The team is formed. Now, the testing. Yet, even before this car rolls out to challenge the giant two and a half mile track, it's a part of Indianapolis history. For new car designs are based on past success. And six years ago, George Sally was mechanic of a winning car here at Indianapolis. In 1951, Lee Wallard rolled Sally's car to victory, the first ever to run 500 miles in less than four hours. This was a revolutionary machine for its time, and George Sally raced to meet it at the winner's circle. Here was light tubular frame construction, its engine placed upright in the cockpit directly over the drive shaft. This was a car designed for dirt track racing first and Indianapolis second. But even as it won, this car was already slightly out of date. Racing engineers were at work building a car designed to race only at the Speedway at Indianapolis. In a year, it would be ready. On a gray, windswept day in 1952, that newly designed car qualified at the Speedway 12 miles an hour faster than Wallard's speed of a year ago. To improve performance in the turns, its engine was moved to the left the drive shaft running alongside the driver. The car had barely four inches of ground clearance. This design would be known by the nickname Roadster. Its driver, Bill Vukovich. But in 1952, other names worried the competition more. The name Novi. These two supercharged monsters delivered almost twice the horsepower of other Indianapolis cars. In a straightaway run at the Utah Salt Flats, one reached 240 miles an hour. A driver said, that last quarter of the throttle, I want nothing to do with. But speed alone doesn't win races at Indianapolis. Handling in the turns was just as important, and the Novi's were big and heavy. The Novi was the fastest car in the race that year. But when the battle began, they weren't in the fight. Charging hard through the pack, Bill Vukovich and his new car ran the competition into the ground. The lower silhouette gave it more traction in the turns. And Vukovich had a heavy foot in the straightaway. In 20 laps, 
he knew the never-to-be-forgotten thrill of running at the head of the field at Indianapolis. The nearest car, a conventional machine, was a lap behind as Vukovic roared through the 480 miles, holding the lead. Suddenly, Vukovic brushed the wall, deliberately slowing his car. Only eight laps from victory, his steering gear failed. A car built for dirt tracks rolled to the winner's circle. Its driver, 22-year-old Troy Ruckman, demonstrated once again that endurance is as important as high speed. And he kissed his mechanic for setting up a machine that could go a full 500 miles faster than anyone in history. In the north turn, Bill Vukovic waited for a tow truck. He would use this car again. 170,000 homebound fans saw the first hint of a new era at Indianapolis. The challenge is new each year, and again in 1953, the giant arena was jammed with racing fans who heard only one name that day, Bill Vukovic. It was Bill Vukovic blazing to the lead with a new first lap record. For all but five of the 200 laps, Vukovic rode in front, setting new records. In the same car that brushed the wall a year ago, he raced to victory. 1954, the dirt track cars had a job to do. Catch Vukovic. Sam Hanks, carrying number one on his car as national champion, was the man to do it. Hanks, a seasoned performer in a fast car, went all out for an Indianapolis victory. Vukovic's roadster was now three years old, and Hanks fought it out wheel to wheel as Vukovic tried to win two in a row. Hanks retired, exhausted, as Vukovic again rode to victory. No driver could stand the jolting ride of the older cars at the speeds that Vukovic could run. In 1955, Bill Vukovic was the man to beat. After a second record-breaking win, Vuki's old car was retired, and he was ready with a new and improved car. As before, the engine had been offset. The driver sat next to the drive shaft, not on top of it. Longer, lower, it could do 180 miles an hour on the straightaway. Vukovic wanted to make it three in a row. Sam Hanks also had a car specially designed for Indianapolis. His mechanic, for the first time, was George Sally. The Novi team answered by getting Troy Ruckman, 1952 winner, to handle the most powerful racing engines ever built. In practice, Ruckman fought for speed and better handling in the turns. But nine years without a change in design left the big cars too slow for the race. The Roadster-type design had passed them. When 33 cars wheeled out of the north turn to begin the 1955 Classic, more than half the field were longer, lower, offset engine versions of Vukovic's winning car. This was the fastest field ever to compete at the Speedway. The leaders roared through the first lap at better than 133 miles an hour. Vukovic cut his way through from fifth starting position in three laps. Vukovic was running in the lead. Once more, the two-time winner was in front, passing stragglers in old dirt track machines. Suddenly, a car spun across the backstretch and another blocked away. There was nowhere for Vukovic to go but over the wall. Sam Hank's beautiful new roadster lasted an hour longer. The transmission failed as he fought for the lead. This was Hank's 10th race. A roadster-type car won. Bob Schweiker, a driver trained in all-out sprint racing over short distances, ran 500 miles that way. There was no longer any question that a special car, a car designed for one race a year, would win at the speedway. Yet, the men who build race cars are never content. Schweikert's own mechanic, A.J. Watson, was already at work planning a new machine with new designs. 
The result rolled out a year later in 1956. Longer, lower, narrower, lighter than the Roadsters. Pat Flaherty drove it to a qualification record, 146 miles an hour. Other garages held other challenges. The mighty V8 supercharged Novi engines had been mounted in lighter, lower chassis. The old front drive engines now delivered power to the rear wheels. Through the years, two men had lost their lives and another had been severely injured in attempts to harness the tremendous power of the Novi engines. Now, the horsepower had been increased to 650. After 10 years of racing, will this be the Novi year? 10 Indianapolis years is a long time for men as well as machines. In 1956, Hanks and George Sally stayed with their roadster, now a year old. Victory here was Hank's one remaining ambition. Higher speeds made racing a young man's business. Swikert won at 29. Bukovich was 34. Hank's is 41. All but three of the cars that rolled into the pace lab in 1956 were built on the Roadster principle. And once more, speeds were higher. Flaherty and Pat O'Connor fought for first place as the Novi worked its way up through the field, then made its move. Taking the lead, the Novi traveled 50 miles in 22 minutes, a new record. Paul Russo sent the Novi screaming down the straightaway at 180 miles an hour. Russo became the first man ever to walk away from a wrecked Novi. When the track was cleared, Flaherty, at the wheel of Watson's car, began to travel. The crowd came to its feet as Flaherty pounded his way to first place. As the race ended, Sam Hanks had second place, only 20 seconds behind. 20 seconds away from victory after 11 years at the Speedway. George Sally watched as Hanks tried, but failed. Clarity roared across the finish line to make it two in a row for Watson and the John Zink team. It takes great skill and courage to take an experimental car down the straightaway at 170 miles an hour to turn left at 135. Every time a new car is designed and driven at high speed, it is a step into the unknown. A year after this victory, Sam Hanks, in George Sally's new car, took another step into the unknown. Hanks has completed six practice laps at the average speed of 142 miles an hour. 21 years ago, Sam Hanks first stepped into a race car. The years have made him fast, smooth, dependable, determined. He wants to win one 500 more than anything in the world, but the competition is stronger than ever. The Novi's are ready. Number 54 has been rebuilt after last year's crash, and with Russo again at the wheel, has posted the fastest official time of the year. Gene Marcinet has been working day and night putting this machine in top running form. A.J. Watson, builder of the winning car for two years, is back with another new one. This for Troy Ruckman. The design is based on Flaherty's winning car, with the engine offset for better handling through the Speedway's left-hand turns. Its weight has been cut to 1,700 pounds. With practice over, the track is closed. Mechanics go back to their garages to make final adjustments and wait for the big day. Listen as Sam Hanks discusses his new car. Well, it took George Sally five years of thought and planning to, and one year to build this car and put it together. He works for the Myron Drake Company that manufactures most of all the high performance engines that run here at the Speedway. 
George's boss, Louis Myers, a terrific race driver that won the 500 three times, has been working with us on this experimental setup. A big problem here at the Speedway is keeping those engines protected at high speeds and high operating temperatures. Engine protection here at the Speedway is pretty much the same problem the average motors has on the highway. We can't get performance without top quality fuel and lubricants, and around here, that means the flying red horse. Race day. The Purdue University band marches into the main straightaway to entertain 200,000 racing fans from 48 states and a dozen nations. This is the world's biggest paid admission sporting event. Reserved grandstand seats were sold out months ago. Last night, thousands slept in their cars outside the speedway, then raced for the general admission to the infield when the gates opened at 5 o'clock this morning. The balloons are released, and the crowd suddenly grows still. This is the day, the hour, the final minute. Tony Holman, Speedway president, speaks the historic command. Gentlemen, start your engines. <laughs> O'Connor, pole position winner, ready to lead them out. The Mercury pace car swings onto the track. The pace lap begins. In a new type start, all cars leave their pits single file and form into rows on the track. From the tower terrace, overlooking the main straightaway, instructions are transmitted by RCA equipment to camera crews stationed around the track. End of the first turn, the Mercury pace car picks up speed in the short straightaway leading to the second turn. Driving the pace car is F.C. Reed, general manager of the Mercury division of the Ford Motor Company. His only passenger is Speedway President Tony Holman. The 290 horsepower Mercury is the most powerful pace car ever used at the Speedway. The pace car tradition started here 33 years ago when Henry Ford served as starter for the 1924 race. The parade swings up the long backstretch. The next time these cars come through here, they'll be traveling better than 175 miles an hour. Of the 33 cars in the starting lineup, 18 are new machines in competition for the first time. Through the third turn, the tension growing, five drivers are in their first Indianapolis race. Here they come, the fourth turn and the field enters the main straightaway. They'll hit the starting line at better than 120 miles an hour. The Mercury pace car streaks into the pit area and the race is on! Pat O'Connor's number 12 roars away from the pole position to the lead. The field settles into the groove in the first turn. The second turn, O'Connor full throttle. Up the back stretch. O'Connor moving away. The third turn, Fred Agabasian challenging. And as they move into the fourth turn, Troy Rutman blasts his way into third place. Jimmy Bryan's pit crew count off the leaders at the end of lap one. The national champion is seventh. O'Connor is turning corners at 136 miles an hour. Heading for the backstretch, Agavation eases off as Rutman sends A.J. Watson's machine screaming into second place. Rutman is coming fast. Suddenly, the crowd roars. Paul Russo has sent the Novi screaming through the field. As Rutman takes the lead, the Novi Special comes up to fourth. Sam Hanks is fifth. Rutman tries to increase his lead, but on the backstretch, the V8 supercharged Novi edges closer. Through the turns, the big Novi must hold position, but on the straightaway, it travels 180 miles an hour. 
and takes second place. Can the Novi get past Rutman? Hank's little yellow car is fourth behind O'Connor and fights him down the backstretch. Russo goes screaming into the main straightaway, alone. Where's Rutman? Rutman heading into the pits. He's slipping out of his seat harness. After only 30 miles, this new car is out of the race. Hanks goes screaming past O'Connor. With Rutman out, this puts Hanks in second place. The Novi mechanic wonders, is that little yellow car a challenge to the supercharged giant? There goes the Novi. Hanks right behind him and gaining. In a burst of straightaway speed, the Novi gains. But in the turns, Hanks, in a lower, lighter car, closes in once more. Coming out of the backstretch, Hanks leads, but the Novi screams past him at 180 miles an hour. The third turn, Hanks passing to take the lead. Now, can he hold it? Hanks stays in first place. Russo and the Novi can't catch him. 400 miles still to go. Cutting through the field from 32nd starting position, Jim Rathman in number 26. His move almost lost in the excitement of the duel for the lead. Russo is in the pits for fuel and fresh tires. Hanks is moving away. Russo, 43-year-old grandfather, has 11 races behind him but none tougher. Refueled and three new tires, the Novi rolls again in 43 seconds. He's in second place, three quarters of a lap behind the fleeing Hanks. Rathman pits. The chiropractic special is a new car, the lightest on the track and one of the fastest through the corners. Four tires, and away in 33 seconds. As Rathman hurtles out of the pits, Russo screams by. Rathman's quick pit stop has brought him within eight seconds of second place. Hanks cuts his way through the slower car, stretching his lead before making his first pit stop. Russo charging. Right behind him, Rathman closing in. Hanks heading for the pits. He's covered the first 100 miles in 43 minutes. A new record. His average speed better than 141 miles an hour. But Hanks doesn't know it. His crew has not been flashing his speed. His instrument panel is disconnected. It's up to Hanks and the experience of more than 4,000 miles in competition on this track. Hanks is away and in the lead. Designer, mechanic, owner. George Sally's every hope is running in that machine. Russo's Novi still in second, but right behind him, Rathman in number 26 is closing in. Rathman passing. He's in second place and his crew sense he's just beginning to run. Rathlin's chiropractic special roars away after Hanks. Hanks' crew warned the front runner, Rathman is gaining. <laughs> Two cars spin. Al Keller in number 16 spins into the wall. Johnny Thompson misses a head-on crash by inches after turning a complete loop in the infield. Keller's not injured but the field is slowed until the track is cleared. Rathman pits for the second time. His pit crew sets to work changing three tires and refueling. These men have made a science out of pit stops. 10 seconds. Twenty seconds.
30 seconds. Rathman is on his way in 33 seconds. Hanks is in for his second pit stop, with Rathman less than a half a lap behind. Rathman takes the lead. Hanks is on his way in second place, less than 10 seconds behind, and a job to do to catch the fastest man in the race. Rathman has turned one lap at 143.4 miles an hour. Hanks is getting traction like a mail train coming through the corners. Hanks closes in at the 350 mile mark. Coming through the second turn, he's moving up the pass. Hanks takes back the lead. That new design works. Three seconds. Can Hanks hold it? Don Edmund spins out. Only 18 of the starting field of 33 are still running. The yellow flag slows the race until the track is clear. Hanks has a 10 second lead and only 15 laps to go. The track is cleared for high speed, but Rathman's crew tell him to take it easy. They want to be sure he'll finish. Hanks is running like a dream, turning the last few laps at 141 miles an hour, an incredible performance. Alice Hanks waits behind the pit railing just a few feet from George Sally and the crew. The white flag is out. Hanks begins his last lap. Jim Rathman's chiropractic special firmly in control of second place. Rathman's run from 30-second starting position has been a beauty. Hanks, coming off the corners like a gunshot, is roaring for the checkered flag. Sam Hanks wins the Indianapolis 500. Twenty-one seconds later, Rathman takes the checker. And one lap behind, Jimmy Bryan, national champion, places third. One minute ahead of Paul Russell's no-buy, running fourth. Here he comes, the 42-year-old winner of the 41st Indianapolis 500. And there isn't a man along the pit wall that isn't happy for him. His average speed for 500 miles was better than 135 miles an hour. Five miles an hour faster than the old record. There are tears in his eyes as Hanks wheels into victory lane where his wife, his pit crew, and George Sally wait for him. This is a dream come true for driver and mechanic. Other men, designing still newer experimental machines, will take part from this victory. For men who build and design automobiles are never content. Hank's share of the $300,000 purse, the largest in racing, is more than $103,000, which, added to prize money won in past 500, makes Hanks the biggest money winner in Indianapolis history. With this victory, Hanks announced his retirement from Speedway competition. Sam Hanks has run his last 500-mile adventure. Throughout the grueling 500, mobile oil protected the engine of the winning car. In fact, the first three cars across the finish line were protected by mobile products. The choice of champions at Indianapolis for the last seven years.